If you have your Bibles, uh, I've got a lot of scripture. Um, go to Daniel chapter 3, look at it, mark it, and then flip to Daniel chapter 6. I'm going to reference Daniel chapter 3. I don't want to read much. It's King Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We all know that story if we've been in church any length of time. Daniel chapter 6, uh, starting at verse number 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Verse 3. Now Daniel was so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king had planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. Just, just, just a mental note, not everybody is excited for the God promotion that's going to hit your life. They couldn't find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, uh, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Goes on to say, uh, you know, they, uh, let me just read it. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king. May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, the, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors, and the governors, they have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered, for in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be appealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows, of heaven, uh, where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Hey, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for this moment. God, I thank you, God, that as we read this word, God, it could come alive in our hearts. God, I, I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. God, I pray you take this word. You would divide it as you see fit, and you would place it into the lives of people where they're living today. Do not let us leave the same way we came, God, but change us, transform us from the inside out. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody says amen, amen. If you're taking notes, I want to preach to you from the subject, that don't fit. That don't fit. Romans 12 verse 1 says this, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become, here it is, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking, but instead fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you and then quickly to respond, respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I love the two F words in that scripture, fix, fit. Because we have two choices as, as Christian people. Do we can either fit ourselves in to culture or we can fix our focus on God. And I think our, 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 our culture would try to convince people like you, people like me, the Christian church, that we are we, we need to we need to 
we need to try to fit ourselves into culture. We, we, need to, we need to look like culture, talk like culture, dress like culture. We need to, we need to, we need, we need to, we need to fit in to culture. See, I think one of the, well, one of the ways the enemy is at work today, he, he is using the same language the church uses, but using it differently. The enemy is using the words like love, but he is prescribing love in a different way than the church in Jesus Christ prescribes love. The enemy is prescribing acceptance, but he's, he's prescribing acceptance to a different level than the church would describe acceptance. The enemy is using the same language, he's using the same text, he's using the same ideas that the Bible says, but he's using it to allure people like you and people like me and the church today to, to, to kind of blend in to the way culture is. In other words, they, he, has, he has a really, really keen way of getting you and getting me to create and take a stance on certain subjects, certain things, in the name of love. So if you're not careful, I'm going to lay a foundation. I'm going to try to teach a little bit today. Culture is after one thing, to try to get the church to look like it. The world is after one thing, to get, to, to get Christian people to come down to the level of the world. We, 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 don't, we don't go up to culture, okay? We go down to culture. Like when we, when we step out of, the, out of the, the, the will of God and we, we find Jesus Christ first and foremost as our Savior, we, we are not, like I mentioned last week, we are not second-rate citizens. Like... Our Father is Jesus Christ, like the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Like, he, he's my Savior. He's, he's my King. And so if he's my King, and a matter of fact, he created everything. And so that makes me a king's kid. Growing up, I was in king's kids in church. And if I'm a king's kid, I'm connected to a king's favor. I'm connected to the blessing of the king. I, I'm, I'm connected to the king who has everything. So... We don't step down out of the church to go up to culture. That, that's not what we do. But I will tell you this. Any, any, any time in Scripture you'll see generation after generation that, that if, if we're not careful, that, that many generations preceding a very thriving Christian generation, oftentimes the generation that precedes that doesn't have the same hunger and love that the generation prior to it did. They would, they would live their life and they would forget about God. They would forget about all the things that he did. They would just go and serve their own gods. They would, they would build gold statues. Everywhere in scripture, if you read, I'm telling you, over and over you would see generations gone by that would come up and be on fire for God. And then the next generation would lose the hunger. And I've got to tell you, I feel like that is a, what is happening in our world today. Living for Jesus, and I mean really living for Jesus, isn't popular today. Building a firm foundation rooted in God's word, planted in the house of God, is not popular anymore. Living sold out for Jesus is not popular anymore. Sacrificing what he wants uh, over what you want is not popular preaching anymore. Honoring God with your body, it's old school, it's not popular no more. Trying to stop cussing is stupid. It's old school. God doesn't care what you say. It's old school. Sleeping around before marriage is old school. It's not biblical. Yes, it is, but it's old school. Spending time with God, devotionals with God, worshiping God other than a Sunday. That's old school preacher. It's not normal no more. It's not popular no more. Uh, it, it's old school to be a sold out Christian. It's old school to think like, like, like what I say or what I think really matters. It's, it's old school to live holy. It's old school to read the word. It's old school to come to church four times a month. It's old school to raise your kids the right way. It's old school to tell your kids they can't watch that. The new normal is attending church when you feel like it. The new normal is attending church when you don't have a travel league baseball game. Don't shout me down today. Because you're in church, they ain't. The new normal is being a, a consumer, not a contributor. There's inflation everywhere. I went to a basketball game and it cost me 15 bucks a person to get in. 
Like, that's inflation at its greatest. You know what, where, the, where, where it hasn't affected the church, where we still complain about giving to God, but we'll pay 15 bucks to watch our kid play two games? But coming to church, like, oh, they always want to take the offering. Yeah, we need the offering to open the doors. And it's not because we need it. God wants to know if he's got your heart. It's old school to take an offering. It's old school to be a contributor. I just want to be a consumer. The new normal is getting saved but not really changing anything. Is this too hard today? I'm going somewhere. I feel like I'm starting off pretty hard. But I feel like this is what we need. Like we're the summer, you're in church. You don't need a Sour Patch, me sour patch message. Like, like, like the new normal is not just getting saved. You know, the new normal is getting saved and changing everything that you got saved from. The new normal is, it's me first, it's my needs first. Hey, what can you do for me? What can the church do for me? Hey, pastor, what can you do for me? No, that's, that's not Bible. It's 2021, the Bible should get rewritten to fit this generation. No, it's time this generation fits its life back into the Bible. But, but nobody talks about it, nobody preaches about it. So, you know. Thought we'd just have a conversation today. We, 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 we preach comfort instead of commitment because we want people to come back. We make sure we don't step on too many toes because we don't want to get hated or canceled on social media. I could give a flip about social media. We talk, we talk more about us and more about what we do for us, more than what we can do for the world. That's not the call of the church. The church doesn't exist for us in the room. It exists for those outside of the room. And so we, we, want, we want the nice house, but we don't want to build a foundation. We want the blessing of God, but we don't want to sow a seed. We want freedom in Christ, but we want to hold on to our secret addiction. It doesn't work. Like if you want to have a nice house, great, build a beautiful house. But if you don't dig down and build a foundation, as big as your house gets, as beautiful as your house gets, and the storm comes, and it will come, ma'am, when the storm does show up, your house will not stand. And so today, let's, let's take a look at what are we truly building our life on. Because if your foundation's not strong, if your foundation's not rooted in God, if your foundation's not rooted in truth, not your truth, but God's truth, then you're, 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 you're in dangerous grounds because the moment that I don't say something you agree with, you think it's the preacher's fault, but realize I'm just trying to put another block on your foundation. Because I know storms are coming. I know culture's coming. I know Facebook's coming. I know TikTok's coming. Your boss is coming. Your, your job is coming, your kids are going to act a fool, your marriage is going to go through struggle, and if you're not got a firm foundation built underneath of your faith, then you're not going to be able to stand the test of time. But it's not popular to preach foundation, Corey. It's not popular. People don't want to hear this. They want to hear how good they are. Well, we're, none of us are good. The last time I checked, if it had not been for God, none of us would be here today. And so we're not good on our own. And sometimes when you start building foundation, when you start talking about subjects like this, like it don't fit, you gotta be willing to let go of some things that you're trying to fit into your life. And it will make you uncomfortable. Sometimes growing is the most uncomfortable like stage of your life. When you go through puberty, it's, it's uncomfortable. Like when you're, when you're growing and you got those growth spurts, it's uncomfortable, right? You, get, you, you, know, you see those kids are like seven foot three and they're seven years old. Like I just read an article, this, this little girl from, from, from China is seven foot four and she's 14 years old. Do you know how uncoordinated she would be? And a lot of times that's like you and I, we want to grow real tall and then we wonder why we fall and stumble all over ourselves. Because we're just in a growth spurt. And sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable. Sometimes you're going to wobble. Some, sometimes you're, it's, it's going it's to it's stretch you a little bit, but that's what growth looks like. And sometimes in order to grow our faith, it's going to require you to clear some of the stuff out of your mind that you've been allowing to infiltrate it. Sometimes in order to grow closer to God, to really take a look at what he wants, because where you are today is not where he wants you to finish tomorrow. Like, I, I, we, you know, when there's a song I grew up singing in church, like, he's still working on me. 
Like I remember like every day, like God is still working on me to make me who he wants me to be. And I, the sun and the moon and the stars, like I remember that song. It's ingrained in my heart. I don't know every word of it, but I know that I know the, the most important thing. He's still working on me. Like wherever, are, wherever you are today, just know this, this word right here. He's still working on you. Are you perfect? No. Don't ever strive to be perfect. You're going to fail every day. But know that God's got you and he's still working on you to make you not who you want to be, but who he wants you to become. And I just came to tell you and encourage you that what you thought was impossible is actually possible. Like you actually can make a difference. You actually can do something significant. You actually can be all who God has created you to be. And I've come to tell you, it's time right now to become who God desires you to be. It's time right now to do what God wants you to do. It's time right now to live a life that does make a difference. It's time right now, by the way you talk, by the way you walk, that people see Jesus in you. It's time by the way you react. It's time by the way you respond. It's time by the way that you live. It's time by every step you go, people should see Jesus in your life. It's time. It's time to give God glory for everything you've been through. It's time to give God glory because you're still standing. It's time to give God glory because that past didn't break you, but it molded you. It's time to give God glory because in the middle of all the mess, God showed up faithful in your life. It's time to give God glory because God is still working on you. In any change that you want to go through, anything that God wants to do in your life, it's going to be a lasting, lasting work. God doesn't work on you on Sunday and then leave you on Monday. He'll start the work today, but he doesn't say, hey, I'm going to take the next six days off. I'll see you back here next Sunday. I promise you, he's going to work on you tomorrow. He's going to work on you on Tuesday. You're going to watch that TV show, and what you've been dealing with is going to be right there in front of the center. And it's not because the TV show had it. No, God had you there to see that, to hear in your spirit and say, I'm still working on you. And the question you got to ask yourself, like, are you willing to step on ground you don't see? Because here's where I know most Christians live. They live in a place called comfort. Because you, you can be spoon-fed the rest of your life, and a lot of people love being spoon-fed the faith. They like, they like Pastor Justin to get that nice peaches and cream and stir it up and just give it to them right on their lips. Oh, it tastes so good, preacher. Because you don't got to feed yourself. You don't got to open up that book. You don't got to ask for revelation. Just Feed me, preacher. Like one of them rock, like baby birds in the nest, just sitting around with your beak open. And I'm regurgitating the word God gave me to give to you. So you can stay that way. Like you can stay that way the whole, your, your whole faith life if you want, but you're not succeeding as a Christian. No judgment, but just know I see those beaks every Sunday. And in two years, you're going to come to me saying the same thing about your life. Well, that's because you're not taking a step in your faith. Like if all you ever do is eat the regurgitated word I give you, you're not growing in your faith. This is not meant to only grow you. This is meant to challenge you. This is meant to equip you. If you're only coming to eat once a week, you're not going to be that good. You're going to be spiritually anorexic. And you need more word. Because when you pick up this book, when, when the Holy Spirit does hit you and you start, man, is that true? Let me, start, let me start looking at what the word says. All of a sudden you start reading words and you'll be like, there are giants to slay. My, my family needs me to fight for it. There are walls to walk around. There are fiery furnaces that God wants to show up in. There are victories that I've got to get with if I keep moving. There are mountaintops that lay ahead of me. There are giants that need slaves. There are people that need me. When you start reading up this word, you know that hey, what God's put in you. Come on, you know he's still working on you. But you've got to learn to read the Bible for you. If you read the word, you know the valley wouldn't last. Some of you think your life's full of a valley. Not nah, a valley seasonal. It's not permanent. But if you don't read it, you think, well, man, this is, this is the way it is to be a Christian. We must live oppressed our whole life. No, nah, that's just seasonal. 
I'm a king's kid. You're a king's kid. He didn't call you to live in poverty. He calls you to live blessed. I'm not telling you, I'm not preaching, I'm not preaching prosperity, but I'm teaching favor. I'm teaching blessing. If my king owns a cow on a thousand hills, I don't need to beg for my money. I better put a seed in the soil and then claim what the book says. Because my Bible says I can't outgive my God. Test me. But some of y'all ain't going to test him because it's easier to feed me. It'd be amazing what the words. This says he'll open up a window of heaven and pour out a blessing you can't even contain. Now, I'll pay 15 bucks to get into the AAU game, but the church ain't getting five. And you end up tipping God and sowing into culture. And when Jesus Christ comes back, culture ain't opened up the door to heaven. Jesus is. You better make sure you're putting your money. This ain't even on my notes today, but I feel the Holy Spirit. You better make sure where you're putting your treasure. Because you can gain the whole world but lose your soul. Preacher, I love God. Show me your checkbook and I'll tell you if you love God. A lot of Christians say they love God. You don't love him if you don't give to him. It's quiet today. Read the Bible and come back and talk to me if I'm not preaching truth today. But when you read it, see, when you read the Bible, like, you, you'll understand that when storms come, storms go. Like, when you understand, like, okay, I'm in the middle of a storm. Like, if I, if I don't jump ship, the Lord will see me to the other side. Like, that's not just some Bible story that we read. That is a, that is a God-breathed scripture for people like me and you now tw over 2,000 years later that are going through a storm of life and we think that's just some Bible story. No, that's revelation for our spirit that says if you don't jump ship, you'll get through this storm to the other side. That's Bible. But you got to read it. And here's what I know about Christianity. We love to put limitations on what God can do and, what God can, and, and who God can save. God doesn't put any limitations on faith. Your faith puts limitations on God. Many of us today, we have a life without boundaries. We go wherever we feel like it. We watch what we want to watch. We say what we want to say. And we wonder why we're not growing closer to God. Well, God understands. No, he doesn't. Do you know how holy our God is? We won't even be able to look him with our own eyes. That's how holy he is. That the angels today are singing around the throne of heaven. And he is so bright, so powerful, so holy. They worship with a wing over their head because they're not worthy to see how beautiful and majestic he really is. That's the God that loves me and loves you. But he's also the same God Christian people flip off and say, nah, I'm going to do it my way until my way no longer works. And then I'll come crawling back to God. And, 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 and God is merciful, right? And he, he welcomes you back every time. But why not be different? Why not just say, I'm going to create a boundary today. I'm going to build my foundation. And I'm not going to let that in my life anymore. I'm not going to let my kids do that anymore. I'm not going to go there no more. I'm not going to say that no more. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm, actually, going to, I'm actually going to create a boundary. See, see boundaries are designed not, not, not necessarily to keep you out. It's to keep the enemy out of getting you. Boundaries and barriers... They, they are actually blessings for the Christian life. But if you lie to yourself, see, culture tell you, don't build the barrier because that's where the fun happens. Nah, I'm building the barrier to keep the devil out. I'm building a boundary to keep hell out. I'm building a barrier or a boundary to make sure that I'm good, my feet's firm, I'm going to say no to that. And I'm going to live my life and be just fat and happy inside my barrier, inside my boundary. That's scriptural. John chapter 10, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's at the gate where the sheep are at? The shepherd. What's the fence? It's a boundary. It's a barrier. Because the sheep think they need the greener grass on the other side. The shepherd's like, why do you need grass over there? 
Look at the pasture that I've created for you. You don't need to go outside the fence and get food. I've got all the food I need right here in the house. And Christian person, you're tempted to go outside of the field. And meanwhile, Jesus is saying, why you got to go outside the field? I've got everything you need inside of this fence. And the danger of Christian people, the grass always looks greener in the culture. Nah, that grass isn't real. It's spray painted. It's fake grass. Because they love getting you to come out there because it feels better. If I can get the Christian to eat with me, then I don't quite feel quite as bad as I, I did before. See, barriers, don't, don't let the enemy lie to you. Like if you're in the, if you're in the barriers of, 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 of faith and the boundary of faith, you're not missing anything the world has to offer. As a matter of fact, you've got what the world really wants. Because inside that barrier, inside that boundary is peace of the Holy Spirit, provision of God our Father. We're walking with the shepherd. We hear his voice. He's our protector. He's at the front door. Ain't no wolf going to come in and try to snatch me. But yet we want this allure of, man, I got to go get. No, 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 that don't fit no more. Some of you are trying to put things on you that, that, that was in your life prior to finding Jesus, and it don't fit no more. Like you used to cuss like a sailor, that don't fit no more. You used to sleep around, that don't fit no more. You used to be stingy and self-centered, that don't fit no more. Because the true life of a believer, it's not how, how much I can keep, it's how much can I give. It's not, hey, can I come and you bless me? No, hey, pastor, how can I sign up and be a blessing? It don't fit no more. The places you used to go, that don't fit no more. I, like the thing you've been drinking, that don't fit no more. Like, just stop, just put it away. It doesn't mean you're going to go to hell if you have a beer, but most people I know have one, have ten. Like, it don't fit no more. And what oftentimes happens is when you line up a Christian with the world, you can't tell the difference. Because we're addicted in the church to looking like the culture. But the reason we're in the church is not to look like culture. The reason we're in the church is to be different. Are we going to blend in or stand out? See, we're afraid in the church to stand out because we think we're too good. No, we're not too good. We're just different. I'm not better than the world. I'm just covered by God's grace. I'm not better. We're not better. But the way the enemy wins is when he says, hey, listen, no, 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 listen. No, just, just act like the world. And when you do, the kingdom loses. He didn't save you. He didn't save you. He didn't save you so you'd look like the... No, no. He saved you so we would look more like him. I'm just trying to help you today. Some of the stuff don't fit no more. And sometimes, like, here, here's where we go in culture a lot of the times is... We end up putting things on us. Come here, DC. I saw you sitting there. And so instead of, instead of, instead of, instead of standing out, we, we cover up. Don't tell anybody that you're an alcoholic because people won't understand. So he hides it. He hides the, he hides the thing that, man, he was once addicted to alcohol, been clean for how many years? Three plus. Three plus years. But, but don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. And you know, yeah, that's perfect. It's not going to fit. That's perfect. And you just keep putting on layers because you don't want you, you you don't want the world to, to you don't want the world to find out that you're saved. Just keep hiding it. 
just keep putting on because if you keep, if you keep putting this on, people won't even know you come to church. Hide that serve team there. You don't want nobody to know you go to the warehouse. And if you're not careful, this is what we look like, Christian person. Instead of doing what God's called you to do and be who God's called you to be, you lower your standards and you keep putting on layer after layer after layer. And instead of experiencing the freedom of God, you walk around with clothes that don't fit. You're bigger than you think you are and you're bulkier than you think you are. And the thing that God's created you to be isn't supposed to be hidden beneath layers. He didn't save you so you could hide it. He saved you so you could expose it. And so I'm telling you, it don't fit no more. Just learn to take it off. Learn to say, nah, that don't fit no more. I'm going to take off that addiction. I'm going to take off that mindset. I'm going to take off that past mistake. And I'm going to live free because Jesus Christ set me free. That don't fit no more. Come on, I'm not living my life to glorify man. We're living our life to glorify God. That don't fit no more. Made it. So great that you watched the complete video. Obviously, the message spoke to you. Here's what you can do. A few things that would help me out, help our church out, and ultimately, I believe, help you out. Let us know what you're dealing with. Let us know what decision you made. Let us know how this message helped you. I mean, there's nothing like uh, receiving a message, but there's also nothing more freeing from your standpoint than sharing your testimony. The Bible says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the Word of of our testimony. Do me a favor, message us, get on our Facebook page, follow us on social media. And even if you live in our region, if you live in driving distance, we would love to have you come join us on the weekend. Check our Facebook out, check our website out for service times. I would love to meet you in person. And until next week, or until the next message that you watch on our channel, do me a favor, subscribe, hit that subscribe button. You, you'll, you'll, you'll stay in You'll stay up to date with all the new content that we're releasing. We're constantly placing and putting new content out on our page. Do us a favor. Get connected. Don't, don't wander through life alone. Ministry, community, faith. It's not meant to be done alone. It's meant to be done together. Thank you for joining us. And I can't wait to see you soon right here at the Warehouse Church. God bless you.